Atoro Talks is devoted to covering topics of interest to general public in engineering, science, music, art, and what's important in our lives in a very simple language. Uh, this video, however, is an exception, and it is meant mainly for structural engineers. Uh, this video was recorded back in 2013 with John's permission, and it's really a classical lecture that every structural engineer must listen to it at least once. So watch this video if you have some basic knowledge of engineering or are a structural engineer or just want to learn about engineering at the very technical level. Um, John Fisher in this video explains uh, how we as bridge engineer make sure that our uh, steel bridges survive despite being subjected to years of very heavy truck traffics. Uh, he also elaborates on what we can do to prevent corrosion of steel bridges. Uh, he also shares his thoughts on what he believes to be the, the best uh, bridge deck system that can survive more than 100 years. Uh, John Fisher, is the greatest living bridge engineer of our time. No questions on that. If you would like to learn more about John at the personal level and get a little more familiar with his thought process, uh, you can watch a video that I posted back in the February of 2024, and the title was Conversation with Greatest Bridge Engineer of Our Time, John Fisher. So, enjoy this classical lecture on Durability of Steel Bridges by John Fisher, if that is of interest to you. So now let's go ahead and start. Thank you, Adara. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, indeed a pleasure for me to address you on this topic, which is one that has been dear to my heart for many decades. Uh, what I'd like to do is to talk to you briefly in a short period of time uh, about a complex problem that we face. And that's the issue of durability, uh, both of existing structures, of which we have many thousands, as well as new bridge structures. My focus is going to be on steel bridge structures, and particularly I'm going to focus on the fatigue of welded connections, the historical development, uh, the details and fatigue resistance of these uh, particular uh, conditions, the role that triaxiality has played very occasionally, but more recently, and then the issues of corrosion and the role of new materials and systems. So those are the principal areas I will try to address today. Adarod, this is not responding. <coughs> The early research that significantly impacted the path that was taken was the Asheville Road Test that was carried out between 1958 and 1960. And during the course of that road test, which involved a number of bridges, both steel, reinforced concrete, and pre-stressed concrete, it was demonstrated that cracks could develop uh, as the bridge was subjected to the cyclic loads that passed in the form of trucks that were driven around the loops. These cracks were found to form in the steel bridge structures at the weld toe. In the 1960s, as a result of ongoing work that was started as a result of the Astro Road Test, primarily the National Operative Highway Research Program, a series of projects were undertaken in which fatigue tests were carried out on large scale welded details of components and basically in the beginning starting as a statistically designed experiment <clears throat> that would allow us to separate the many variables that were said to be a significant factor in fatigue. Those would include such things as the minimum stress, the maximum stress, the stress ratio, material, and details. 
What we found in the course of that study is that basically fatigue plaque form forms for two reasons, particularly in welded systems, and that is they form from internal flaws from a number of details or from the weld toe. And at the weld toe, there are discontinuities that exist in all welded systems as a result of the process. And it does not matter what that system is. There are these types of discontinuities that exist. And they are then the source of crack growth. They are the source of crack growth, which you can see on this particular slide, shows from those discontinuities that exist at the well toe in a high stress concentration region, we have then a semi-elliptical crack that forms and propagates. And so from well toes, in which the discontinuity is not detectable by any modern uh, scheme of non-destructive inspection. We have a high stress concentration condition and the possibility of fatigue crack propagation. What we found then when we looked at this in terms of the statistical variability was that the effects of minimum stress, maximum stress, the R ratio were not significant factors. There was only one primary variable, and that was the range of stress to which the element was being subjected. Now that separated then the dead load, for the most part, from the traffic that actually causes the propagation and development of the deep cracks, which for uh, highway bridges would be primarily truck traffic, for railroad bridges, it will be different. So for bridge structures, then, we do not need to be concerned about the R ratio nor the maximum stress, but only the range of stress to which the element is subjected. Another variable that was thought to influence fatigue resistance was steel, the type and, and grade of steel. In fact, from studies that had been carried out in Europe just after World War II, it was claimed that intermediate grade steels had higher fatigue resistance than other grades. What we found was that was not true, that there was no significant influence of the grade of steel. Whether we were dealing with a carbon manganese steel of a low yield point, an intermediate grade steel, or a high strength steel, they all, for a given detail, had identical fatigue strength. And again, that is represented, as you can see here, for both the upper bound for welded details, which is when the fatigue crack develops from those internal discontinuities, to a lower bound, which is the crack propagation from the weld toe. Now, the reason, primary reason why that there is no significance for these other stress variables is the fact that in welded systems, we have residual stresses from the welding process. This welding process then provides for a locked-in stress that is in equilibrium on the cross-section and is called a residual stress. And at the weld toe, what we find most of the time is that that stress is near the yield point in the zone in which much of life is exhausted and hence the dominant effect then, and the reason that there is no R ratio influence is because this residual stress is always there. So when we look then from the statistical evidence for a detail in which we had hundreds of test data at many levels of stress range, we find that we have a log normal distribution of life. Now, the log normal distribution, one must remember, is not on stress. It is on life. All right, so for all levels of life, all levels of stress range, then we have a log normal distribution. And then this exists for all welded details. 
And so for fatigue design, what we have taken for the resistance side is the fact that we make use of two standard deviations from the mean to the lower bound. And that lower bound then has been established, which provides a 95% confidence of 95% probability of a crack developing from, and is based on the experimental database. That is where the, the resistance side of this problem comes from. And hence, in the ASTRO code, as well as the AISC specifications, and most other specifications worldwide, fatigue design for systems, welded structural systems, is based on the stress range. And we have then a classification of details that represent, for the most part, the nominal stress condition does not be, in fact, it incorporates because of the different classes the stress concentration effects that are associated with each of those details. And in 2009, uh, the types of detail conditions that are indicated in the current specifications, both the ASTRO code and the AISC code states, typically provide uh, the comparable conditions in this pictorial form that provides you an aid to establish what you should design for. Now the other side of resistance when we call when we come to the actual structural system is a function of the variability in loads. We know that the transportation system, whether it be the roadway or a railway, is traversed and those bridge structures are subjected to a combination of conditions for the most part the response of the structure to generally a single vehicle load. There is some effect of adjacent lanes, but for the most part, for most bridge structures, even including long span structures, where only the local effect normally controls, such as a suspension bridge or other type. When we look at the load spectrum, we find that it really has not changed in significant ways from decades ago. And if we look at existing spectrum today, we find that for the most part in the highway system, we have a bimodal distribution in which the lower mode is not really that significant. And in the higher modes, we see that we have variability, we have maximum loads that can be significant. Now we represent and can represent that spectrum of loads with an effective stress, which is shown as a vertical line. And that's because when we look at the response of actual details and real bridge structures, we find that they provide stresses that are comparable to that that there is this variability. We find the same type of spectrum that exists in rail traffic, except, again, it may have a bimodal distribution that is higher, uh, particularly because today the rails carry a very high axle load. So we have this skewed spectrum that the actual vehicle that we design for, which is the effective load, we can transform that effective load into stresses. But what we find when we do this, and this has been true for literally thousands of bridges in which stresses have been measured, that the predictions that we make for the stress in the actual bridge, for the most part, is greater than what we measure. And hence, in the actual spectrum, then this dashed curve that you see is what the real bridge sees rather than the direct transformation of those loads to that spectrum. And so there is that adjustment that has taken place. Now, we have actually also carried out 
And so there's been an adjustment in the application of the loads to the design reference load that reflects this difference between what we observe in, the, on, in bridges and what we would analytically extrapolate to the bridge structure. We've actually carried out in decades past variable load studies in which we've placed on welded girders with these severe details that we've looked at and where we've had experience in the actual uh, load <coughs> and structural systems cracks forming uh, which have developed in and across the United States. We know and found for these studies that when we apply a random variable load, that if we have only a small number of cycles exceeding what we call the fatigue limit, and the fatigue limit is the level of stress range below which we do not observe any crack growth at all. There is that threshold. And so when we exceed that threshold on a bridge by a, a given amount, we find that that causes interaction and, in fact, brings many other cycles into play. And so as you see out to 100 million cycles, that in this particular case, we can see that for a category E detail, which has a fatigue limit of 2.6 KSI, which is what, less than 20 megapascals, that we have crack propagation forming. And so that is why we find that if we exceed what we call the constant amplitude fatigue limit by as little as 0.01%, that means once in 10 in a thousand, once in 10,000 cycles, that we can then have crack propagation develop at those kind of details. So in design, then we try if we have a structure that is going to be subjected over its lifetime to millions of cycles, we would like to have all of those cycles that are less than having an exceedance of only one in 10,000. So that's why we don't concern ourselves too often with your overloads that you occasionally allow to cross structures. Now we've found that this behavior that we observe in the laboratory under variable loading does in fact, as you can see here, uh, two different bridges uh, in the United States that have formed fatigue cracks uh, at the well toe. And so we know that the observations that we've made in the laboratory, we have seen experience in the field. Now, recently we have an anomaly that happens, which is what was the case in 2000 uh, when the home bridge in Milwaukee experienced a rapid fracture, not only of one girder, but of all three girders at that cross section. Two of them as you can see from the two lower photographs, in fact, severed the flange and the entire web. The third member, essentially the crack formed in the web, but did not penetrate and destroy the flange. So we have a three girder bridge in which the cracks of significance, ones that you would visually see, uh, formed instantaneously. When we looked at the micro level, what we found was we could not see any fatigue crack propagation. In other words, within one uh, millimeter of the source of crack growth, all we could find was cleavage. Cleavage means then it was an instantaneous separation. It was brittle fracture. And that was because we had a triaxial state of stress at the given detail. Now these three beams, the detail was not much different than what you see here, which was only in the same city, but on a different bridge. Here you can see fatigue cracking has formed. Whereas when this triaxial condition, 
which is quite sensitive to small gaps. The triaxiality within a quarter of an inch can make the difference between whether we have a condition of possible cleavage from a triaxial condition. Now, with modern materials where we have toughnesses that are many times higher than what the minimum specified in the astral code is, we probably would not see a cleavage fracture develop in a triaxial stress state because it would once it it would have the capability of resisting that crack uh, for a much longer period of time. Now, over the course of the past four decades, actually at least four decades, the most dominant kind of cracking that has developed in the United States, and, in, and I can say it, form, it is formed in every state in the Union, is one due to distortion from small gaps. Now this, cor this source has its birth in the fact that after World War II, the uh, Astro Code adopted a provision that said it was bad practice to weld transversely to the tension flange. That was the result of experience in Europe in the 1930s when the very first welded bridges that were constructed in Germany and France and Belgium experienced brittle fractures. And those brittle fractures developed from weld toes of components that were welded transverse to the tension plane. So that experience, which was because the steels that were developed in U era were very brittle. They inherently were not tough. They didn't have any significant Sharpie V-notch values ever associated with them. In fact, in many bridges in that era, no one ever tested the material for toughness. That only came about as a result of the collapse of the Silver Bridge. And so we have then a rule that was incorporated into the Astral Code after World War II that has been the source of, major, of the major cracking that we see that has formed in bridges that we have here in the U.S. They typically form in these web gaps because the structural systems that we build and design are three-dimensional systems. And because we have relative deformation between adjacent elements, if we do not have connection plates that are attached to both flanges, then what we do is we form small deformations in a very small gap. And what that does, it elevates the cyclic stress from a condition that is, would be acceptable if we were not sorting the web out of plane to one in which we distort the web out of plane and as a result, then we grow cracks from the weld toe along the web flange weld as well as at the end of the transverse connection plate. And we've made measurements on many bridges in which this is demonstrated to be true. This is a particular bridge that was in West Virginia. You can see when trucks cross that structure in one lane, they deform the gap. And within the gap, we have a high stress. And then when a next truck come along, it deforms it the other way. And when we look at this from a rainfall count of the random variable spectrum, then what we see then is that we have an amplification of the stress cycle that occurs between these vehicles which cross at separate times, but in line with one another. And so that's why we find even today structures that were built 40 years ago that suddenly have some of these cracks developing uh, as we speak because it has taken that long if they were in a artery in which they did not have a huge number of vehicles. It has taken that long to accumulate enough uh, to cause this type of cracking. Now that cracking typically develops from both sides of the web, even if you do not have a weld on the opposite side. And that's because the out-of-plane uh, deformation, as the crack, the 
forms from the side where the weld toe. As we deform it, then the residual elements that are on the opposite surface result in a crack initiating from the opposite face. And as a result, that locks in. You can think of then, if you are analytically wanting to uh, put your mind around it, that you can think of that as putting like a hinge at that point, but, but the hinge not allowing displacement. And hence, as a result of that, if we have this type of cracking, we can sometimes we can stop it by just drilling holes. But other times, the holes don't work. And we need to do other things, such as you can see from this structure where drilling holes uh, did not stop the crack. And so you needed, in that case, to retrofit and stop the deformation. Now, stopping the deformation means you are not dealing with a stress problem, but a, a distortion problem in, in terms of rigidity. And so you don't want to try to stop with a small element that you're adding, because the deformations will not be brought to a minimum. And so you want rigidity <coughs> and not continued deformation. In other cases, it might be possible to soften. Yeah, I know you no longer probably think of this in terms of slope deflection, which in prior to the age of computers you may have used to calculate your stresses. But as we make a gap much bigger, then we have a significant decrease in the stress that can occur in that large gap. And that has been shown to work in a number of structures that have developed these kinds of cracks and could be used as a design criteria for even a new structure. Now, there are some systems, particularly if you're in the course of designing a bridge, perhaps using tubular systems. In tubular structures, there is, and this is the case, for example, with your signs and luminaires in which you do, in fact, have out-of-plane distortion. In fact, one of the primary sources of some of the fatigue cracks has been the base plate has not had adequate thickness. And not only that, often a hole has been cut inside to allow wires to go through and water to drain. And so basically the, the base plate was too flexible. In that case, then nominal stress, which is what we have used more frequently, and that's for planar systems, that's a, the, probably the best way to go. But there are conditions that may require you to use a local stress, sometimes called the hotspot stress, to do that. And that's been done, for example, in the new astro code for sign structures and luminaries, in which uh, significant work was done uh, the NCHRP program at Lehigh and looking at this particular problem. Now, there is a hooker, though, with that particular type of approach. That approach is based on crack growth. And that means you do not know and cannot predict from a hot spot stress analysis what the fatigue limit is. And so that means then you have to turn to other sources or you're going to have to carry out experimental data. And that was what was done in the case of the luminaires and in the citation that is provided in this slide. And you can see uh, in which the hot spot stress on the, the curve on your left uh, shows the resistance for the local stress. And on the right plot in which the infinite life was provided by carrying out experiments uh, where we pried a significant number of structures to ensure we could determine what the fatigue limit is. So in applying hotspot stress, always keep that in mind. Now let's turn to the other primary variable we have to durability, and that is corrosion issues. There's a loss of section and pitting that we have to deal with. There are changes in the structural assumptions. Corrosion can change the structural assumption. And so 
we want to look at cracking, cracking due to pack out and the role that weathering steel has. Now, open bridge joints should not exist. We should not be building bridges today that have joints that are open and in which we are taking salt and debris and dirt and dumping it not only on the road surface, but we're destroying the structure beneath it. So open bridge joints should be eliminated. We should not be using open ridge joints. Now, if the corrosion develops notches, we know that can reduce the fatigue resistance. And we see that in railroads in corroded structures uh, that have formed fatigue uh, at those locations and find that actually when the, the corrosion product produces a notch that's greater than half the thickness of the element, you can bring the fatigue resistance down to category E, which is below what we would normally associate with a welded or riveted component. But these open expansion joints can change the structure's response. And we saw that when the Mianus Ridge Bridge collapsed uh, back in, what, 1983. That collapsed because corrosion product developed. That corrosion product, as you can see from the bottom of the pin where the washer spacers have pack out, and in fact then on the outside that push the pin hanger to the end of the pin. And that in turn resulted in a fatigue crack forming because of a massive increase in the bearing pressure. So we had complete collapse of that structure because prior to the event in which the last hanger separated, the hanger that remained on the bridge was the inside, and it had already failed long before. So this failure occurred because there was not only deformation that took and pushed the hangers to the ends of the pin, but it also introduced stresses and caused the structure to not act like a pin system. A pin system assumes that we're going to have rotation there and not have any resistance to the rotation. Now corrosion packout has also occurred because in many box systems that we use for trusses, we have openings. <clears throat> and those openings allow water and debris and that can cause, as you can see, the separation of the flange, which has the openings from the, from the hanger walls. And this was found to occur in some of the diagonals as well. So corrosion pack out can lead to cracking because not due to fatigue, it's just the increase in pressure that exceeds the resistance of the weld component. And so it is then a condition of durability. I have seen people who have placed in four beam trusses that are made often when one designs a truss structure of holes that were placed to eliminate weight or the size of the steel plate. And the holes were placed on the top. And all that does is allow the dirt and debris to go into the box structure and causes far more uh, damage to the system. So one way to alleviate this, which has been done on a lot of structural systems, is to either use plastic or fiberglass inserts that are held in place to prevent the moisture and debris from entering into these box elements. So control of water and debris on structures, I think, you should give more serious thought to integral abutments as well. So we should eliminate all the joints we can from bridge structures to enhance their durability. That mean, and there's no reason we can't do that. Some states have tried this and it's worked well. And with modern analytical techniques, 
for analysis, we should be able to design systems that eliminate holes in structural slabs on which these vehicles operate so that we can remove this as a means of decreasing the damage that we see in these structural systems. Now, I would like to address in just a few moments the issue of toughness and corrosion resistance. Today, the high-performance steels that we use, and almost all the steels we produce today, for the most part, can be high-performance steels because if they're low carbon, they are produced in a fashion <clears throat> that is advanced manufacturing. And as a result, then, we end up with structural steels that instead of having the minimum specified, often have a foot-pound that is almost up close to 200, between 100 and 200 foot-pounds, even at a minus 40 degrees. So we have materials of superior fracture resistance, which means we should not experience cleavage fracture in these types of materials. What, and that means then the, what we have often associated as brittle fracture with cleavage should turn into something more related to yielding. And eventually, if you yield it enough, you might reach the tensile capacity. And so we can then deal with that kind of condition with modern steels by just using simple net set section theory. We wouldn't even have to use fracture mechanics to access what was going to happen. And weathering steel is better today with the steels that have been developed. And so we have more corrosion resistance uh, for weathering. But it does not change the fatigue resistance. So high performance materials do not change the fatigue resistance when we weld these into the structural system. And that's been demonstrated by uh, work that has been carried out over the past several decades uh, on copper nickel steels as well as uh, the HSLA-80 steels that are used for combatant ships. And even uh, the same has been observed in non-magnetic stainless steels that are also were under consideration for combatant ships. So, the fatigue, basic fatigue resistance then is not changed by selecting material. It is changed by your proper use of the stress cycles and details. So fatigue is a detail issue. The details matter. They count. Now I'd like to address another aspect, I think, of the future, and that is the use of orthotropic deck systems. I think orthotropic decks, in my opinion, have the only possibility of producing a slab system on east structure that will give you more than 100 years of life. We have carried out tests, for example, on the Williamsburg Bridge in developing the data. We, we know today pretty well what the conditions of stress that are developed at, at details that are used for orthotropic decks. This is a detail then that was developed and used on the Williamsburg Bridge. We have carried out enough tests that we can relate that to these details in the experimental data that we have uh, in the database so that we have some confidence for the number of details and what their fatigue producers can be. We've carried out similar tests on the Bronx Whitestone bridge deck that has been put in place. Uh, that also has, at the details that were considered critical, has had excellent performance. We have measured the response of these elements in the field and can relate them to the laboratory results and find that the calculation of stresses can be made. And for the deck element system, we know that the cyclic stress spectrum is one that is now dependent primarily for some of the most of the details in the deck upon the wheel loads, 
the actual wheel loads that are uh, subjecting the deck to pressure. We find from measurements of the spectrum uh, that, in fact, uh, for the orthotropic deck, that it's necessary to consider a wider spectrum than what we have found to be applicable to other welded stroll systems. And that is now reflected in the specifications that ASHTRO has put on place, has put in place for orthotropic decks, and also can be found in the Federal Highway Administration's uh, manual for orthotropic decks that has been published in last year. And we can see, for example, the orthotropic deck that is now in place on the Bay Bridge in California that has an expected life of 150 years. And there is no reason that orthotropic deck will not provide that. That shows what it looked like last year. And the deck is now installed in it is, this bridge will be open this, this year uh, around Labor Day. So we have seen from laboratory evaluations and other applicable conditions that we can, in fact, provide a deck system that will give more than 100 years. It's not going to be a concrete deck, in my uh, opinion. It's going to be a steel deck. So let me summarize this presentation to you in the following. Today, we know that only the strut range is a controlling condition for structures that we build. That it is the, mac the, the condition that is of consequence. The material that we use really does not matter for fatigue. It does matter for fracture. That means, this, in essence, details are the primary source of potential problems. And, and hence, it is the design of details that is the challenge for you in making bridges that are going to have long-term durability. <clears throat> so they are the, the, the cause. We know we need to keep bridges clean. And we need to control water and debris. That has been demonstrated over to be the primary cause for one of the durability issues in steel structures. And with that, by eliminating joints <clears throat> and providing integral abutments. And the use in the future, even though we've, we have some orthotropic decks in this country that go back uh, to the 1960s. But we should be able to put in place decks that can exceed a 100-year life of the service. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the message that I would like to bring to you. And I would be glad to, uh, and pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, John, for a very great presentation. And certainly, those of us who are the students of the engineering, this is one of those lectures that you have to listen to at once. Uh, we have a number of questions that I've received. And uh, what is your recommendation for um, protecting the steel structures in the coastal area? Uh, metallizing or galvanizing, do you have any thoughts on that, or weathering steel? Or if I, maybe if I can expand this one, maybe now we have an 8 and 10 steel that's available. Your thoughts on those? Well, obviously, uh, some types of stainless steel uh, are very resistant. And on the other hand, though, not all stainless steels are resistant to salt, salt water. And if you look in the stainless handbook, uh, there are some that say you could only use them if they're in uh, any water that is not, or in any spray that does not involve salt. So that would be an upper bound to resistance in the coastal area. And, and perhaps uh, there are some of those fields. 
if you can keep the structure clean, I think that's, to me, keeping it clean is more important than paint, from what I have observed. If you kept it clean and you didn't have joints, uh, even if you were not too far from coastal areas, you would probably be in pretty good shape. But I, I find where most corrosion that I observe in areas was due to the fact that there's failure to keep structures clean. We allow dirt and debris to accumulate because we don't want to wash it. Um, so keeping structures clean will be a means of enhancing it. And I do think uh, zinc, although zinc has, I think for many coatings, about a 50-year life of oxidation. If you look at uh, some of the experience we have with uh, suspension bridge wire, in which oxidation can lead to eventually to pitting, and pitting uh, can then lead even to corrosion, uh, cracking. So uh, to me, the more important thing is to keep it clean and keep water from getting and debris from getting on the structural system, which means eliminating the joints. Okay. Uh, there's another question that can you explain the, the pinning uh, uh, to increase the fatigue life, and do you think that works? Yeah, I didn't have time to put in here. Yes, Let, let's go back to the basics. I showed you that in the aswood condition, there's a residual tensile stress at a well toe. Now, when we enhance, we, we know we can enhance fatigue, fatigue, fatigue resistance. In fact, we did this on the Yellow Mill Pond Bridge on I-95 in, in Connecticut before it was eventually replaced. That bridge was one of those that developed the fatigue crack on the cover plate. And in 19, in the, ni in the 19, early 1980s, that bridge structure was peened, air hammer peened at the weld toes. And that prevented any future cracking. Even when we peened, when we could detect small cracks in the order of a quarter inch long at the weld toe, we peened those as well. And when that bridge was finally removed from service, which was in uh, about 2000, we took some of the bridge beams that were peened experimentally back in the 1980s before the whole structure. They, we removed those and tested them in the laboratory. We found there had been no subsequent crack propagation at all at those peen details. So what does peening do? Peening ultrasonic impact treatment air hammer peening, needle peening. What it does is that it, you introduce compression residual stresses at the weld toe. Those compression residual stresses prevent the live loads from introducing a stress range that is damaging because it's in compression. And as a result, then the crack does not propagate. So by putting compression in, we overcome the residual tensile field that exists there. And that's why these enhancement procedures are in use in many applications. They, are, they have been used in uh, other type of structural systems, such as um, rotating shafts for sewage treatments. Uh, and for a number of applications besides some bridges. Uh, so peening is a system that can work, and I think it should eventually, actually UIT, ultrasonic impact treatment, is in the Astro construction specification. One question is related. Could you comment on the terminating the weld at the end of the plates or wrapping it around mm. as far as a good practice goes? Yeah, that particular what we found from the laboratory work is that if you had a cover plate that was narrow, more narrow than the flange to which it attached, and you terminated the wells, or if you took that same cover plate and wrapped the weld around the end, we found that it made no difference. They had the same fatigue resistance. Now, on 
On the other hand, if you take the cover plate and make it wider than the flange, and so that your welds between the cover plate and the flange were then uh, along the edge of the flange, that created a more severe geometric condition. And hence, uh, for if you look at the specifications, you will find that if your cover plate is wider than the flange to which you attach, you are mandated to run the weld around the end. Because that brings it back to that category. Whereas if you terminate the welds on the edge, the tip, that actually is much worse. And, and you, can, you can analyze that as a fracture mechanics model and explain it in that term, that, that that's a condition. And actually, we have a bridge that proved that. There was a bridge across the Housatonic River in Connecticut that, in fact, had gusset plates that were welded to, it was a girder bridge with floor beams. And the gusset plates were welded to the floor beam flanges. And they were big in order to accommodate the laterals. And they had welded only on the tips of the flange. And cracking developed in that, at that detail uh, in about five years of service. And he had to peen it. Uh, in order to stop it. So there has been both laboratory tests and field experience that verify that type of behavior. And the last question, John, is that what is your recommendation for if you have a bridge with the details at intersecting wells, what, what should be done? No, this is the issue of triaxiality again. Um, if the material is superior, then it shouldn't matter, because that's what's done in ships all the time. Otherwise, you'd have water coming through these holes if you didn't seal them off. So there, it, it depends on the triaxial condition and the, the fact that you may introduce defects. If you have material, and, and the reason there's concern more than any is that we know in most of the older pieces, the material isn't really great in the fact that it has super toughness. And so in that case, often what is done is to take a hole saw and cut a hole and open up and, uh, that particular area to, to one, remove whatever discontinuity that might be there, and two, remove the triaxial condition. Thank you, John. I guess on that note, we, we'd like to again thank everyone for uh, participating in this webinar, and thank you for uh, coming down here and sharing your thoughts with us.